Hi, everybody, um, and good morning or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thanks for very much for joining us today for IPA's webinar on increasing hand washing adherence uh, in the wake of COVID-19, um, part of IPA's Evidence Matters webinar series. My name is Rachel Steinecker, and I'm the Associate Director of Program and Business Development for IPA, and I'll be hosting and moderating today's discussion. Just before we get started, I wanted to remind everyone that we will be recording today's uh, session and then sharing a link afterwards. Uh, I also wanted to remind you that you can ask questions at any time through the uh, session, but we'll answer them at the end of the session. So just fill them in in the little box below uh, and we'll, we'll get to them after the, the presentations. Okay, great, let's get started. So I wanted to start by introducing our two uh, other speakers. We have Amy Pickering, Assistant Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Tufts University. Uh, Amy's research focuses on disease transmission in low-income countries, as well as developing uh, low-cost and scalable interventions to interrupt this transmission. We also have Robert Dreibulbus, who is an Associate Professor at the London School of Health and Tropical Medicine. And Robert's research focuses on the impact of water, sanitation, and hygiene, or WASH interventions, and the determinants of WASH behaviors. So welcome both so much, and thank you for, for taking the time to be here. So today we're here uh, to discuss hand washing, as we all know, one of the key behaviors recommended by the WHO to interrupt the transmission of COVID-19. Um, but I'll start by taking us a little bit through IPA's approach to ensuring rigorous evidence is used to inform uh, programs and policies to improve the lives of those affected by poverty and some of the key barriers and enablers of hand washing in low income countries. So as everyone here is already very aware, extreme poverty is an urgent issue under normal circumstances and even more so during a crisis like we're facing today. We also know that members of the global community recognize this and have invested uh, in the development of thousands of programs and policies uh, to help those affected by poverty and humanitarian crisis. But the problem is, is a lot of these programs tend to be based on intuition or best guesses of what works rather than on evidence of what actually works. At its core, IPA exists to help solve that problem. So we develop and conduct rigorous research on different strategies to reduce poverty and to figure out what actually works. We do this primarily through the randomized control trial or the RCT, which is an intensive scientific methodology uh, considered the gold standard to measure the effectiveness of a program or a policy. Um, and is also used in medical sciences to determine the effectiveness of a new treatment. But we also realize that no matter how quality our evidence is, um, they won't uh, affect change unless they're actionable and utilized by the government and organizations who are directly supporting low-income communities. Because of this, IPA not only works to share, uh, to generate our evidence, but we also work to share our evidence strategically, both at the global level, like we're doing today in this webinar, um, but also at the local level in the 22 countries where we have permanent and long-term presence. Uh, so to date, we've worked with more than 600 researchers to equip more than 700 partners with evidence from over 900 evaluations that we've conducted around the world. And the beauty of our approach being rooted in a methodology, um, a research methodology, is it allows us to work across multiple sectors that underpin or overlay or can help mitigate poverty, including health, education, social protection, just to name a few. And over the years, we've developed significant expertise in these key sectors and others, and have leveraged this expertise to launch specialized research initiatives um, in response to urgent and pressing issues. Most recently, uh, we've launched, launched Recover, or Research for Effective COVID-19 Response. And through Recover, IPA is working to equip decision makers in vulnerable contexts with timely data, evidence, and analysis to allow them to uh, respond to the COVID-19 crisis in an evidence-based way. And we're currently doing this through three core avenues. Um, we've already launched a rapid response multi-country panel study globally uh, to inform government partners and other key partners on the health, economic, and social ramifications of the pandemic. Um, we're also rapidly developing more than 80 new individual research studies related to uh, COVID-19 response. And we're collaborating with dozens of governments and peer organizations to share information, resources, and timely data uh, to inform the global response to COVID-19. 
So providing timely information to those responded, responding to the COVID-19 crisis in low-income countries is especially urgent. Um, and this is because individuals in these countries may be hit harder by the pandemic, uh, both by being at higher risk of the immediate health impacts of the crisis, as well as the longer term economic and social impacts. The World Bank recently projected uh, that the financial impact of COVID-19 may result in 24 million fewer people escaping poverty in 2020 in East Asia and the Pacific alone. So we're talking about massive impacts here. This is due at least in part to the fact that poverty creates barriers to one's ability to access critical resources and information, as well as comply with COVID-19 mitigation recommendations such as social distancing or hand washing. So policymakers around the world are currently faced with some difficult decisions about the most effective way to contain the outbreak, while also protecting vulnerable families that may face hunger due to um, the measures put in place uh, to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19. So navigating this crisis requires access to timely innovation and evidence, which is something that we're working to facilitate. So this mandate brings us back to the central purpose of this webinar, uh, to share evidence on the barriers and opportunities to increase hand washing in low income settings. So let's zoom back in for a minute on this. Um, as we know, hand washing uh, is one of the most recommended behaviors to interrupt um, the COVID-19 transmission and to slow its spread. Uh, by the WHO and other leading authorities. But we also know that following hand washing guidance um, is not necessarily possible or easy for everyone, especially in income constrained areas. Um, this is because washing your hands requires several key inputs, including access to hand washing facilities, water, soap, access to information on proper hand washing techniques and behavioral triggers. Um, IPA to date has conducted uh, dozens of studies in the area of water and sanitation, um, as well as several studies specifically on hand washing. So let's get a little bit into that evidence before I pass it over um, to our guests. So let's start with hand washing facilities. As many as 40% of the global population uh, currently lacks access to basic hand washing facilities. Though simple hand washing systems are often utilized, um, we're probably familiar with a lot of them like the jug and basin method or tippy taps. Um, the issue with these is they often require significant soap and water for use, which is problematic in areas that lack access to piped water and to soap, uh, which is a very common issue in many households and communities. An example, in Johns Hopkins uh, most recent DHA, DHS survey, 36 in 36 of the countries included, less than 50% of the households had access to soap and water at a hand washing station. And in some countries, this level was as low as 5%. So IPA has already started to tackle these issues. An example in partnership with MSR Global, Catapult Designs, uh, Amy, myself and others um, led the development of a hand washing station, um, the Povapoa, which means cool foam in Swahili. And the POVAPOA's real innovations are its integrated water frugal nozzles and taps uh, and secure foaming soap dispenser for use in areas that lack access to uh, soap and water. Amy will give a little bit more in depth uh, detail on this, um, but our research has demonstrated that the POVAPOA allows for a staggering 15,000 hand washes per $1 spent on soap and is nearly twice as water effective as a tippy tap. So next we've got the issue of access to information and triggering hand washing behavior. So even if you have a hand washing station and you have soap and water, um, many people may not be aware of the correct steps required to wash your hands properly. And they also may not be aware that hand washing can interrupt the spread of infectious disease, which is something a lot of governments are working right now to communicate. Um, Pre-COVID-19, unobserved American doctors were only washing their hands 20% of the time, and that was in a time and a place when they were set up for success to wash their hands. So imagine how much harder it is to comply with this when you're living in a remote region of South America, working day in, day out just to put food on the table. Um, historically, it's also relatively rare to observe people washing their hands for the full 20 seconds recommended. So IPA has also innovated in the field of information and behavioral interventions uh, to promote hand washing, including testing hand washing instruction and the use of discuss triggers and social norms to increase hand washing among school children. Um, so when I was in Kenya, we used skits to highlight the potential to get feces on your hands after using the latrine. 
and then attempting to shake hands with uh, the school children afterwards. Of course, they scream and they yell and uh, they think it's disgusting. And this creates a reminder in their head that they need to be washing their hands after uh, using the latrine. Um, in our research, introducing information on hand washing techniques, these disgust triggers uh, in combination with hand washings in schools, uh, we were able to increase hand washing with at least water from 13% to 77%. So in sum, uh, navigating this complex issue requires uh, a lot of thought um, and a lot of different inputs, uh, such as hardware, consumable resources, uh, information and behavioral triggers. So with that context in place, I'll hand the conversation over to Amy to start walking us through uh, some of this evidence in more detail. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, thank you, Rachel. Um, so I'm going to be talking about hand hygiene in low resource settings in the context of COVID-19. So I just wanted to start out by talking about how respiratory viruses are transmitted because it provides the motivation for why hand hygiene is so important. So um, uh, respiratory viruses can be transmitted when an infected person coughs um, or sneezes and produces droplets that contain virus particles. And these droplets can be, um, they, can, they can fall on surfaces or they can be inhaled by nearby people. Um, and that's how the virus can be transmitted from one person to another. Uh, so hands can play a role in transmission by um, an infected person shaking hands with somebody else or touching a surface that then somebody else touches. And um, so hand hygiene can interrupt transmission by um, preventing you from exposing yourself after you touch infected surfaces or contaminated surfaces. Um, and hand hygiene is also super important and effective when people that are infected um, practice hand hygiene. Um, so uh, studies have shown that when someone is sick and they're practicing hand hygiene, they're much, much less likely to transmit um, the virus to other people. And this is particularly important in the context of COVID-19 because we know that asymptomatic people can transmit the virus to others. So a little bit about SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that actually causes COVID-19. So it's an envelope single-stranded RNA virus um, the thing about envelope viruses is that they're actually more fragile in the environment than non-envelope viruses, which is a little bit counterintuitive. But that's actually a good thing for this virus because it means that it doesn't persist for that long outside of the body. Um, we do know that it survives longer on hard surfaces, such as steel, glass, and metal. So it can survive and be infective for two to three days on these surfaces compared to soft surfaces, such as cloth, paper, or cardboard, where it typically persists for only a matter of hours. So this is important because when you think about when you're in public places and you're touching hard surfaces, those surfaces are going to be more likely um, to transmit the virus than softer surfaces. Um, it's also important to note that virus transfer efficiency is when, so when you take your hand and your skin and you're tucking, touching a hard surface, the transfer efficiency of virus particles to your skin from a hard surface is much higher than from non from porous or soft surfaces. So we also know that the virus survives a little bit longer in colder temperatures and low humidity conditions. Um, so weather definitely affects um, how long it survives in the environment. Uh, the good news is that it's susceptible to heat, um, UV light, ethanol, isopropanol, bleach, soap, and other disinfectants. So almost all disinfectants that are typically used for surface cleaning are effective against SARS-CoV-2, which is great. So the current hand hygiene methods that are recommended by the CDC and the WHO um, for disinfecting your hands from SARS-CoV-2 are hand washing with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. So the 20 seconds refers to the scrub step. So scrubbing your hands with a lathery soap for at least 20 seconds so that you can physically remove those virus particles from your hands. And also it allows the soap to um, basically destroy the virus. 
Um, Alcohol-based hand rubs are also very effective, and the key is to make sure that you're using one with at least 60% ethanol or 70% isopropanol. So in settings where neither of these options are available, um, another method that will work is to use a low concentration chlorine solution. So diluting bleach to um, a concentration of 0.05% chlorine will also work for um, hand, uh, as a hand hygiene agent. Um, and so you can rinse your hands with this solution as well. Okay, so as Rachel was alluding to, obviously there are a lot of infrastructure barriers to hand hygiene in low resource settings. Um, Rachel already mentioned these statistics, but over one fourth of the global population lacks access to a place in their home to wash their hands with soap and water. Um, and this, this percentage is even higher in low resource settings like in Sub-Saharan Africa. We also know that alcohol-based hand rubs are expensive and unavailable, even in high income countries right now. So it's very difficult to get access to them. Um, and I think as this picture demonstrates, hand washing is awkward and time consuming when there is no piped water or a tap available. So you have to rinse, you have to wet your hands, you have to get soap, you have to lather, then you have to find some way to pour water all over your hands, which is very difficult to do on your own if you don't have someone helping you. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about enabling infrastructure that can help make hand washing easier in settings that lack access to piped water. And the idea here is hand washing stations that provide convenient um, and easy to access and reliable access to soap and water. And I would say that in general, um, what's been found is that higher end, more durable, attractive commercial products are more likely to encourage hand washing and um, sustain hand washing behaviors over the long term. Um, and of course, whenever you're thinking about installing a hand washing station, you need to make sure you have a plan for refilling water and soap. I think Robert's gonna talk a little bit more about that. So I just wanted to go over some design features that are important for um, encouraging hand washing behavior. So uh, hand washing stations that are water conserving are really valuable because um, it's a lot of work to refill hand washing stations with water. And as we know, water is limited um, in low resource settings. And uh, hand washing stations that use a soap um that is uh that that there are soap frugal as well um are are also valuable uh, it's important to note that you want to have a hand washing station with with parts that are easy to clean and to disinfect um, because biofilm formation can be possible inside of hand washing stations you want to use durable materials especially if a hand washing station is going to be outside in the elements um, exposed to uv light you want to make sure you're using plastics that are um, able to withstand um, exposure to the sun. Um, and in terms of location, it's been found that hand washing stations that are visible and hard to avoid are more likely to encourage hand washing behavior. And then there's two things I wanted to mention that are kind of specific to the current pandemic. Um, and so you would think about, it's important to think about um, hand washing stations that generally require minimal touching for usage, particularly if, um, particularly thinking about touches that have to happen before the hands are washed, and then um, having to touch the same um, location after your hands are clean. So for example, a tap that has to be turned on um, and then turned off after hands have been washed could serve as a fomite, a transmission hotspot um, for transmitting the virus. Um, so it's also useful to think about if you have um, hand washing stations in institutional settings, thinking about putting taps one meter apart um, to encourage social distancing in the current pandemic. So I just wanted to go over some tap options for hand washing stations that um, reduce the uh, likelihood of cross contamination between people. Um, so, uh, taps that are able to be opened and closed with an elbow or a forearm are really good. Um, taps that have a time delay, so they shut off automatically after a certain amount of time are also useful. Um, taps with sensors that can sense motion of hands are very expensive, but obviously are helpful because they're hands-free. 
Um, and then foot pumps. So foot pumps where you can use your foot to actually dispense water as you're um, wetting and rinsing your hands are quite useful because not only do they allow for hands-free usage, but they also um, usually help you conserve water as you're using them. And I also wanted to note something that not everyone was always aware of, but um, all the evidence that we have to date suggests that water for hand washing does not have to be sterile. Um, so non-potable water is very, still very effective for hand washing with soap. Um, and you just have to be concerned um, about hand washing water that is highly contaminated. So for example, has concentrations of E. coli over a thousand um, E. coli per, per 100 mils would be cause for concern, um, but that's a pretty high level of contamination. So in terms of soap options, I did want to note that soap does not have to be antimicrobial. Um, most studies have found that antimicrobial soaps are not more effective um, than plain soaps against bacteria, and most of these antimicrobial compounds would not be effective against viruses anyway. So you can just use plain soap, it's fine. Um, and then uh, I wanted to mention soapy water and foaming soap is two um, strategies for a soap source that can um, be highly soap frugal and be very cost effective. So soapy water um, involves mixing water with a powdered detergent or even a small amount of liquid detergent and storing it in a plastic bottle. And you can put a hole in the top of the bottle to dispense the soapy water. And this is um, really useful because it prolongs um, a, a small amount of soap for many, many hand washings. And also, it kind of makes soap um, is a dedicated, uh, dedicated for hand washing and less likely to be repurposed for other uses. And then as Rachel noted, foaming soap is also an option. So if you have access to a foaming soap dispenser, you can mix five grams of detergent with 250 mils of water to make a solution that can produce foaming soap. Um, and you can get 15,000 hand washes for every $1 spent on soap. So very cost effective. And this is just some data that we collected um, with one of the earlier versions of the POVUPOA, where we found that um, you can see for every uh, dollar, uh, per, for every US dollar spent per 100 hand washes, um, if you're using a soap frugal and water conserving hand washing station, you're going to be spending a lot less on uh, soap and water refills. So I also wanted to point out some resources that have actually um, been developed in the last month. So UNICEF has done a great job putting together some compendiums for types of hand washing stations that you can use um, during this pandemic in low resource settings. Um, and so here are some links uh, that um, show where these compendiums can be found. And I also wanted to note that the WHO has a guide to local production for alcohol-based hand sanitizers. Um, so this has all the steps and ingredients and um, equipment that you would need to do local production of alcohol-based hand sanitizer. So I think it's a really useful guide for um, organizations that can have a safe space to do this production. So that's all I had for my presentation. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Robert. Uh, thanks, Amy. Uh, sorry, I'm just uh, struggling with the technology here for a second. Um, so, try that. Um, great. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, so, kind of, I'm going to, building off kind of what Amy and Rachel talked about, um, we're going to talk more now about kind of hygiene, hygiene. Um, Sorry, I, my video wasn't um, started. Um, we're gonna talk about um, hygiene and hygiene behavior change um, aspects. So when we think about kind of within the uh, context of this global pandemic, you know, we, we've heard that we know that hand washing with soap is a very critical intervention to interrupt the transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Um, 
Luckily, we have a long tradition of hand washing promotion in public health. Um, it's incorporated into a lot of public health campaigns. Your organization uh, may already have a significant number of materials available for hand washing promotion. Uh, this isn't something new. Um, it's something that we really have a long, long field to build from. What this means for COVID-19 though, um, is that we're dealing with, with a behavior um, that specifically there's probably a very high rate of exposure within the general population to hand washing generally and hand washing messages specific to COVID-19. What the challenge is now is that we need to be able to adapt these messages and targets and the delivery of them to respond more to the kind of realities of this, of the current pandemic. But luckily we have a large body of knowledge to kind of help us and inf help inform our behavior change strategies as it comes to hand washing with soap. Um, so kind of important that this is also not the first outbreak that we've ever kind of that has ever happened um, and but we we have been able to kind of learn quite a bit about what happens to hand washing and hygiene behaviors during pandemics or during any kind of a disease outbreak first we see kind of a massive increase in exposure and messaging so people are kind of getting inundated with new messages about the about the current disease whatever the outbreak is i think you know kind of if you take a walk outside during whatever limited amount of time you're allowed out of your home right now depending on where you are you're probably being confronted with countless images about uh COVID-19. Uh, you know, I here in London, I can't walk down the sidewalk very far without seeing, you know, multiple posters telling me what I should be doing. Um, most of which are saying I should be home, but I'm allowed to be outside. Um, the other part of this is we know that risk perceptions change quite drastically during the uh, pandemic. So things like a fear response often ta uh, takes over and people start changing their behaviors in response to this kind of perceptions of risk. New norms start emerging, so new behaviors kind of emerge within populations that, that are kind of in response to this pandemic. Um, you can think here kind of some of the things, kind of new norms around how you greet people when you see them in the streets. So, uh, you know, no uh, kind of the new social distancing, the leg pumps, all of these new things that we've started doing in response to a kind of a pandemic situation. And finally, when it comes to hygiene, people really do start adopting a lot of preventative hygiene behaviors. So we see hand washing, of course, kind of go up quite significantly in response to an outbreak. Uh, the challenge though, is that these are often kind of short-term gains and short-term changes in individual behaviors. So when we look at kind of cross the board in terms of long-term changes uh, in hand washing behaviors, there was a recent systematic review by DeBrook et al. that looked at various intervention and intervention strategies to really see what was very effective in kind of long-term adherence and sustainability of behavior change. Um, they kind of categorized interventions into four categories, information and education, community-based approaches, social marketing approaches, and psychological and social theory. I think one thing, um, the, the kind of key part here is that if we look specifically at, at, at um, interventions that are focused on information and education, we see that these are associated with very uh, kind of, they're likely ineffective for adherence and long-term sustainability of behavior change. So when we think about messages and hygiene promotion, I think our default, particularly within an outbreak context, is to focus on teaching people lots of new information. But this is ultimately kind of shown to be ineffective in the long term in terms of sustaining behavior change. Some key things to think about kind of for COVID-19 when it comes to the key moments and how we need to be kind of approaching um, behavior change. Our traditional promotion of hand washing over the past kind of several decades has really focused in on the transmission of enteric pathogens um, and, and key moments that are associated with the, tra with the prevention of diarrhea. So before food, before feeding a child, after using a toilet, and after clean, uh, ch cleaning a child or changing diapers. Now, Amy did a great job of kind of explaining the kind of complexity about transmission dynamics of kind of, era or kind of uh, respiratory pathogens. And this is presenting us with a whole new range of moments that we need to address in our hygiene programming. So this is after coughing or sneezing, when entering 
or leaving a building, after physical contacts with, uh, contact with individuals, after touching high contact surfaces, anytime after visiting public spaces, or after caring for sick individuals. We have kind of new moments that any kind of hand washing promotion um, efforts that we do need to take into account all of these new kind of points where hand washing should be occurring. Our traditional approaches to hand washing promotion also really target kind of caregivers and young children. So really how can we address kind of improve hand washing for young children, which makes sense when we're thinking about diarrheal disease. But if we think about the epidemiology of COVID-19, it's a very different population that we're really concerned about. Here, there's part of just the prevention of general transmission within the population, but that means we need to address adults, we need to address non-caregivers. This is really kind of new, new groups that we really need to target with any of our hand washing, our, our hand washing behavior change approaches. Um, so when we think broadly about hand washing with soap, uh, we know that our kind of evidence shows that knowledge isn't really kind of a driving factor of hand washing behavior change. Um, but instead, what we find there's multiple theories, uh, behavior change models, uh, kind of that are, that are kind of across multiple disciplines, all of which highlight the importance of. Uh, a whole range of determinants for hand washing with soap and their various kind of their, the importance of each of these determinants is it kind of changes between and within populations. I'm not going to read out all of the lines here but just to say we know that there's a whole lot of things that can really influence whether or not someone is going to wash their hands with soap. So we're going to talk about kind of a few kind of basic principles of hand washing uh, promotion to think about in terms of COVID-19. The first is that kind of adaptation is necessary. We can't think of this pandemic as something that's static. Uh, you know, in the UK here, uh, just yesterday, they announced kind of we're moving into the new phase of response to this. Um, our messaging has changed. What the population is being recommended to do is changing. And it's our responsibility for, as kind of programmers is to make sure that our messages actually align with these various stages of the outbreak. Now on the right here is this kind of disaster res response cycle. That that might be kind of something that to help guide that that during kind of the initial response or the immediate sense we need specific behavior change interventions as the outbreak wanes or kind of moves into the recovery stage we need to change our messages um, and kind of adapt what we're promoting in line with that um, some other key parts of hand washing promotion it's really important that any messages we use around hand washing with soap Grab and keep, uh, grab and keep people's attention. Uh, we said before, hand washing is not a new behavior. Uh, we've all washed our hands at some point in time. You'd be hard pressed to find someone on the planet who has not had some type of hand hygiene behavior before. Uh, we're being inundated with messages around hand washing with soap, the importance of it. This is something we've ar we're already doing. We might not be doing it enough, and we might not be doing it at the right times. But hand washing is not something new. This isn't like social distancing or other interventions that are very strange. So thinking about messages that are surprising and engaging. Uh, this image in the center is a soap demonstration um, where you can kind of put some soap on, on your fingers and dip them into water and magically a bunch of pepper that's floating in the water kind of moves away. On the right, kind of these, these messages, these images about hand washing with soap that aren't just about wash your hands at these key steps, but really kind of using very visual and graphic imagery. Another part to think about with hand washing promotion is that there's really no one size fits all approach here. Um, what we really need to do is define our target groups and identify the appropriate touch points for them. Different populations in uh, different populations groups will have different determinants and it's up to us to make sure that we're tailoring messages and the delivery to reach those populations. So this could be kind of changing from adults to school aged children. Those are going to require very different strategies. We can think about various settings, so schools, health centers, crowded urban, urban spaces, or the domestic environment. There might not be one message that works for everybody or that can even reach everybody. And to, in order to kind of find the most vulnerable, we've really got to go out of our way and make sure that our messages and our delivery strategies are hitting the tar populations most that we want to actually hit. Another part is to really make sure that messages are specific and actionable. 
uh, the more specific and clear we can make our messages around hand washing or hygiene behavior change generally, uh, the more effective these are going to be. Um, so in the middle here, this is a kind of a photo from a colleague of mine uh, uh, that was outside of a camp, a refugee camp um, in Ethiopia. And the message was simply maintain personal hygiene. What this means, what exactly kind of falls within that, uh, that kind of domain, um, um, who knows, um, but kind of more specific messages um, that can kind of really focus in on very specific behaviors um, or specific junctures are just generally much more effective than these kind of broad umbrella of kind of you know, vague uh, requirements for behavior change. So another key principle here is that kind of hand washing with soap really does require an enabling environment. And when we kind of think about that, that can be a broad policy environment or a very local enabling environment, which means that infrastructure is very important. Amy kind of and, and Rachel both alluded to the statistics that we have that people with hand washing facilities in their home are much more likely to wash hands with soap at key moments. That includes having a dedicated location for hand washing for with where both soap and water are stored together. Uh, but we also realize that people aren't at home all of the time, even under lockdown conditions. You know, there are new um, kind of new WHO guidelines on the provisions of infrastructure for hand washing with soap in public spaces. Um, as schools reopen, we're looking at kind of new efforts of how can we kind of increase infrastructure in schools to enable appropriate hand hygiene um, and healthcare facilities. We need to uh, kind of increase hand washing availability in those areas. All of these are going to require systems and processes for maintaining and ensuring supplies. So this means kind of F4 programs, we've got to think through monitoring and evaluations. How can we make sure water stays available? How can we make sure soap stays available? But really that infrastructure is a basic requirement for any type of behavior we want people, we want to see. Um, another part is uh, kind of thinking about hand washing with soap is that we can use infrastructure creatively to be part of the behavior change strategy itself. Um, we kind of refer to this often as cues, reminders, or triggers, and they've proven to be very, very effective at increasing hand washing behaviors if used appropriately. Um, so some of the images here, this was a study we did using kind of just environmental nudges. Um, so these kind of simple iconography near uh, toilets uh, in Bangladesh that were associated with large increases in hand washing with soap among school aged children. Um, these uh, the, the eyes here, um, there are studies that have shown that that was associated with an increase in the likelihood people would wash hands with soap just because of that feeling of being observed. Um, and then also this, this kind, of, kind of a negative nudge or kind of or, or cue here. Um, these are kind of germs that are painted on a bathroom, sto uh, bathroom stall door, which um, kind of can lead people to kind of associate that with hand contamination. And thinking through how we can integrate kind of, uh, kind of triggers or cues into infrastructure is one approach that we need to make sure that we remember um, during hand washing programming. Another part of kind of hand washing promotion is to really make sure that we're making hand washing aspirational. Um, and that means kind of linking hand washing back to emotions and motivations. Uh, um, various studies have shown that these are important drivers of hand washing behaviors, and they, we can use them quite effectively to increase uh, behavior, kind of hand washing at key moments. A number of kind of emotional states have been used to uh, promote hand washing with soaps uh, quite successfully. Uh, this includes the associating hand washing with nurture or kind of wanting to be part of taking care of children or others within your community. Um, the affiliation, uh, kind of the desire to be part of a group. Um, this has kind of come front and center and a lot of kind of uh, public health messaging around COVID-19. We're in this together. This is all of our kind of collective responsibility to manage this. And these can be important motivators to maintain hygiene after some of those initial fear responses have kind of waned a little bit. Um, so we need to make sure we're remembering this kind of emotional or motivational aspects of hand washing behavior. Um, finally, it's, it's also kind of important that we take advantage of any of these new norms that emerge during pandemics and use those to become part of our hand washing promotion. Um, so the more we can make these new behaviors normative, the more we know that they're going to stick around after those initial kind of fear responses subsided. Uh, so an example here was the clean hands challenge, which went all over social media. Uh, the director general of WHO, uh, or, or the um, 
uh, that's uh, the image in the center is Gloria Gaynor, who was singing I Will Survive while washing her hands with soap, which was one of my favorite ones. Um, and so, you know, we, we see kind of a number of these inter uh, strategies that we can take advantage of to kind of help promote and establish new norms around hand washing with soap. Um, so finally, I know this is kind of a whistle stop tour through hand washing promotion. Um, I want to end here with kind of a, to pr another link uh, similar to Amy. This is the, uh, the COVID-19 hygiene hub, the website there, www.hygienehub.info. Um, this is an initiative that is recently launched. It's housed here at uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, but we have a broad pool of global experts from all over the map who are kind of engaged with this initiative. Um, there on the website, you can find peer-reviewed resource documents in multiple languages that are growing every day that are all related to various aspects of hygiene behavior change. Uh, we provide real-time support through a chat function um, in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, we're inviting organizations to share information about their own research projects or, um, or, or their own interventions, and we can help connect you with other organizations. Um, and finally, we also offer an opportunity for kind of sustained, dedicated support from this global panel of technical and creative experts um, if necessary and if requested. So uh, please go to the website. If you're running a program, please share that information. Um, we're more than happy to kind of hear from you and, and, and make sure that any learnings that you're providing can be disseminated broadly. So I'll stop. Uh, great. Thank you so much, uh, Amy and Robert, for both of your presentations. Um, I think that they really helped to add a lot of uh, context um, to the discussion and understanding of what works and what doesn't work to promote hand washing uh, currently during this pandemic. So now it's time for everybody's favorite part, uh, to put you on the spot and share some of the many questions that have come up from our viewers uh, during this webinar. So I think I'll start with a two-parter, uh, which is I'm sure at the top of many people's minds, which is how can we best support communities who don't have access to um, safe and clean water um, to wash their hands? And how can this information, the resources we've discussed today, um, reach individuals who are living in low-income areas or remote areas when there's uh, ongoing lockdown in many of these uh, places? Sure, I can I can start out and then uh, Robert can add um, his thoughts. So, um, I mean, I think that this is a, a very critical question and um, hopefully some of the information that we've shared today can can be a resource. Um, so I think one thing that's helpful is that, um, you know, you don't need sterile water to do hand washing. Um, and that there are a lot of uh, hand washing stations now that are very effective at conserving water for hand washing. So I think that those are, are two strategies to uh, think about and consider. Um, in terms of reaching communities during this lockdown, it's obviously challenging. Um, I think that having really good local partners um, that have communication channels open with communities is helpful. Um, also using uh, mobile phone messaging and text messaging um, can be one way to reach people. Um, putting up signs and banners in public places um, could also be a strategy. Robert, do you want to add anything? Um no, I mean, I, I think that kind of really hits, hits the main points. I think thinking about kind of who are the key populations we want to reach, and even if we don't know how to reach them, there are probably groups and organizations that are directly engaged with these, with, with these populations. So making sure that we're kind of engaging and coordinating among other partners, you know, uh, kind of 
there, there's been no shortage of response to COVID-19 on the ground and making sure that we're kind of linking in efforts there. Um, and, and, you know, really kind of thinking again, kind of back to this idea, there's really no one size fits all approach. What might be effective at reaching one segment of the population may not reach another. You may need to think about kind of various age groups for younger populations relying more on social media or internet, whereas older populations that might require kind of some of our more traditional approaches to behavior change. So loudspeakers or public banners or things like that. So being very kind of creative and thinking through how we reach them is going to require kind of engagement on multiple fronts. I see that there are some Q&A questions that were submitted by audience members. Um, Rachel, would you like us to take those now? I could. Yeah, and I can, if any stand out to you that you immediately want to address, certainly go for it, or I can uh, highlight some of the, the ones that have uh, come in thus far. Yeah, so there was a question about, um, is there a risk that people might get sick if they drink the chlorine-based water aimed at hand washing? Um, yes, uh, so very important to label hand washing stations um, for hand washing purposes and not for drinking water. So um, there are, you know, images that you could use to, to indicate that the water source is not for, for drinking water. Um, and particularly if it's a 0.05% chlorine solution, very unsafe to drink. So um, definitely you would want to label it to make sure that people understand what, what it's to be used for. Um, there was also a question about um, kind of the cost of soapy water versus foaming soap. So Rachel and I had mentioned that we've calculated in Kenya that foaming soap, um, for every one dollar you spend on soap, you can get over 10,000 hand washes. Um, I don't know the exact numbers for soapy water, but it's also very inexpensive for many, many hand washes. Um, it's, it's not going to be the exact exactly the same because foaming soap does actually um, you can even, you can use even less soap for hand washing with foaming soap than than soapy water because of the foaming aspect of it but soapy water is obviously very cost effective and a great option um, so there was also a question about I'm just, I'm just, I'm just going through all of them, Robert. I don't know if you want to jump in. No, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think these are great audience questions. Um, so uh, one person asked, is there data or modeling about the relative importance of hand contact versus droplets and aerosols um, as roots of uh, COVID-19 transmission? Um, there's, not to my knowledge at the moment. I know that a lot of people are working on modeling right now, um, but there's not a lot of data yet on what are the most important transmission pathways. Um, we do know that large droplets um, expelled during coughs and sneezes are definitely an important transmission pathway. There's more debate about the importance of aerosols, which are much tinier um, droplets that can travel longer distances. Um, is a route of transmission and can be inhaled by people that are further away. Um, and then, you know, the, what's the, what's also, how do those compare to transmission by touching contaminated surfaces? Um, our group is actually doing some work right now where we're sampling high touch surfaces in public locations to try to understand what's the prevalence and concentration of the virus um, on these surfaces in public locations like crosswalk buttons, um, trash can handles, door handles, things like that. So once we have more data on that, I think that these models will be possible. Um, there was also a question about should we, is there a risk of putting too much attention on hand hygiene versus mask wearing? Um, so mask wearing was outside of the scope of this webinar today, but it's obviously very important. Um, and um, I don't think we're, that we're not in any place to say which one is more important, hand hygiene versus mask wearing. They're, most, they're both very important. Um, but, but there is a lot more data on the effectiveness of hand hygiene in preventing um, transmission of respiratory illnesses, um, just because mask wearing has not been as, com as, as common of an infection prevention measure. Um, but I think we're going to have a lot more data on that soon. And, and just to build on that, I think, you know, if, if we think about kind of some of these behaviors, you know, that thinking that, you know, if, if 
there's there's certain context in which mask wearing or certain countries or, or certain settings and you know primarily kind of you know in East Asia, mask wearing is not an uncommon behavior. Uh, whereas if you go somewhere here, if I go outside, I'm still surprised when I do see someone wearing a mask. So thinking about kind of each of these behaviors are kind of given their rel you know, equal importance, there's a different kind of need in terms of what the behavior change strategy actually is. Hand washing is something that kind of, you know, at least in high income settings, you know, we, we surround ourselves with, with water, there's soap in most places. We really, the importance there is really kind of triggering and enabling that behavior. Um, whereas something like mask or social distance distancing, this is something that we're really trying to encourage a very new behavior and need to approach kind of that kind of uh, kind of in that context. I think kind of understanding each of these behaviors within their specific context and wanting to kind of uh, kind of at least weigh kind of how new this behavior is, how, how likely it is, and how able a population is to actually complete that behavior can really help inform kind of our trade-offs between focusing on specific kind of strategies within that um, one population. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and you, know, I, we, you know, I know I kind of as, as a behavior change kind of person, uh, we often kind of put a lot of focus on things like formative research and, and that type of stuff, which is often quite difficult to do within the context of, uh, of you know, lockdown conditions without actually endangering the populations we're trying to reach. But there are a host of creative ways that people are going out doing a lot of this very basic formative research. So online surveys, telephone surveys, in conditions where it's still safe to leave the home. We've seen people arranging focus groups where everyone is six, where, where everyone is two meters apart in these kind of drawn out chalk circles. So there's still interesting ways that we can do some of this basic formative research. And for any behavior change going, that we're doing, even like a little bit of data is going to be better than no data, but also kind of drawing on the wealth of data that we already have about understanding behavior as well. No, absolutely. Um, it's great. It's great to see the flood of questions coming in as well. Um, another question that came up from the audience was, are, can you talk a little bit about whether there are certain subgroups that the interventions or strategies we've talked about work best for? Um, and lessons learned on what hasn't worked. Uh, so what shouldn't we be doing in uh, our response to the COVID-19 outbreak? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take a first pass at some of this. I think kind of, you know, what we've seen kind of traditionally from handwashing behavior change interventions are that knowledge-based interventions alone, so it, it, interventions that are really focused on teaching people kind of ways when to wash hands and how to wash hands might have some short-term impact on behavior, but they're really not effective in the longer term. So after a while, you know, th this is something, and we're seeing this across the globe with any kind of the survey data that's coming out from a variety of locations, people in general know what hand washing is, they know its role in COVID-19 prevention, and they know how to do it. So kind of really kind of going back and throwing that out the window in the context of a pandemic may not necessarily be something we wanna do. There might be new things we need to focus on. So making sure that we're triggering or we're kind of understanding that there's different moments now than if, when we were focusing kind of primarily on diet real disease prevention, um, you know, kind of new things around respiratory hygiene, the kind of coughing and sneezing into your elbow. Like these are all kind of newer things that we might need to uh, kind of build a basic amount of education. But what we know doesn't work is never moving beyond that basic education. Um, so, so that's kind of one thing. Um, in terms of subpopulations, I think, again, so kind of if we look at the history of, of, of kind of hand washing promotion, uh, we've really hit kids, kids in schools. We've got a whole range of things. There's various levels of effectiveness with those interventions and caregivers. What we don't know very much about is just kind of how do we change hand washing behaviors in the general population, which is what we really need to be doing for something like COVID-19. So, um, yeah, over. Okay, great. Um, Amy, anything to, to add on? I, I think Robert handled that one well. <laughs> um, okay, another question that has come in is, um, what are some of the most effective entry points we should be thinking about for these interventions and programs when we're talking about um, 
uh, the highest impact for mitigating transmission. So should we be targeting trying to get these types of resources or information to households? Should we be working in markets or clinics? Or what are your thoughts from the existing evidence on um, where we could have the, the biggest bang for our buck in terms of disseminating these resources and information? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and, and I think as economies are starting to open up, it's a very important question. And I would say that ha having hand washing facilities and um, messaging available in public locations like institutions such as schools, um, daycare centers, um, healthcare facilities, um, in any markets anywhere where there's going to be lots of people um, congregating in small spaces um, would be great places to focus efforts. Robert, do you have anything to add? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I think, you know, the kind of where are we going to get the kind of the most effective interventions for for it is is an appropriate question. But I also think it's also needs to be coupled with where are other people already intervening? What are efforts ongoing? I don't think kind of, you know, we're, 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 we've seen with COVID-19 kind of the you know, the massive shift across, you know, I can't think of a single organization that's not shifting their programming, no matter how tangentially, uh, tangentially related it is to COVID-19 to address this. So, you know, making sure not just kind of where we can interrupt transmission, but where we can add value with our own efforts. Um, you know, what are the gaps in terms of coverage and how we can fill those. So, you know, it's not just epidemiology, it's kind of the operations of, of this as well. So. Right. Um, no, very, very relevant and useful information. So uh, the last uh, kind of big question that's come out is what are your ideas on um, how the interventions we've discussed today can be scaled up rapidly, uh, given the urgency of the, the COVID-19 outbreak? Robert, do you want to take that one first? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was um, the um, yeah. I mean, I, you started. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think scale up is uh, is a, it's a it's a tough question. Um, I think that it's it's very helpful to think about if you can partnering with government institutions um, or organizations that have um, a broad reach. Um, but I also think it, you need to be careful about what you're scaling up um, and how. So you want you want to be definitely sure that um, you've got something that that definitely needs to be scaled up and should be scaled up. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely agree. Kind of making sure that what we're scaling is 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 appropriate and effective, um, and 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 kind of thinking through the kind of key pathways to scale. And again, I think a lot of this comes back to kind of you know coordination, working with other actors. You know, there's not just kind of one. You know, it, it's no one ind individual or one organization that's going to launch something at scale. It's going to require kind of concerted effort across various organizations, and making sure that we're building on an evidence base we know what works or we have kind of strong evidence that something works and using that primarily coordinating through uh, kind of through go uh, government bodies or in-country coordinating mechanisms. So things like the global wash cluster exist within each country to really serve kind of within many countries to serve as a coordinating organization across or across many older, many different bodies that are involved in wash response specifically to outbreaks. So kind of finding kind of the right pathways to this is really critical. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions, Rachel, on um, if we're going to be able to share the slides from today. Do you have a, an answer for how we can do that efficiently? Um, that's actually a great segue. So I know we have a lot more questions coming in, but we are at the end of the hour. So um, uh, we'll be able to share this information in two avenues. So first, we'll share the link uh, for the recording of the webinar. Um, so all of you can go through it and review it and also uh, share it with the networks um, you might have that are also working to um, address the, the COVID-19 response. Um, and second, we also know from our very long list of attendees, which is great, we have a lot of people uh, watching right now who are either implementing WASH programs um, in low-income countries, researching WASH or supporting this type of work. 
Um, so we'll also be sharing a link to a form where participants from today's webinar can indicate what they're currently working on and if they're interested in connecting with some of the other participants um, who have been with us today to think through some of these issues in more detail and apply some of the, the lessons learned from our discussion on um, uh, how to respond to the COVID-19 um, outbreak. So um, in closing, I just are there any kind of final remarks from uh, Amy or Robert from yourselves? Um, well, thank you both so much for joining today's webinar and thank you all for who are tuning in and watching right now. Um, I think it's been a very helpful discussion, uh, a lot of very relevant information that hopefully you can utilize in, in your own responses um, and taking away a lot of insights and understanding on how to tackle the issue of hand washing in low income countries. Um, so thank you very much. We'll be in touch with these resources and uh, thanks and stay healthy. Stay healthy, everyone. Thank thanks. you.